Hello, welcome to Talk Wildlife and an interview today with a sort of a regional feel. Um, we've already talked to Ellie about dragonfly conservation in the UK and we've talked about dragonfly hotspots in England and Wales. What we're going to do though today is we're going to take you to the origins of the hotspots where the project all began and that's Scotland. So hi, first of all, Hello. to Danielle Muir, who is the Conservation Officer for Scotland, is that right? That's right, Scottish Officer of Conservation is my official title. Scottish Officer, right, brilliant, <laughs> okay. So, first of all, welcome. And we were talking just before we came on and uh, I started recording and I'm not even gonna mention Ospreys. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So first of all, I think what we'll do is if we introduce yourself and just just give us a little bit of background to what you do up there okay. and then we'll talk a little bit more general about sort of conservation of, of dragonflies in Scotland. OK, well, my name is Danielle Muir. Um, I'm, as you said, I'm the Scotland Officer Drag uh, Conservation. I'll say that again. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> you're the Scotland Conservation. Are you the whole of Scotland or just part of it? And you're, you are the Scotland Officer for Conservation in Scotland. <laughs> That's right, I'm the Scotland Officer for Conservation in Scotland. So basically my, my remit, um, I, started for the, I started working for the BDS in um, 2013 and at the time I was working as um, a ranger part-time and um, I just finished working on a swift conservation project and the the BDS Scotland officer job came up, which looked perfect for for my skills. So, um, I was really excited to start working in 2013. And um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the of the post, um, I was to set up um, a series of dragonfly hotspots. But the the job has sort of morphed; it's changed a bit as as time goes on. So now I work on the dragonfly hotspots. I work on the dragonfly key or priority sites, which are sites that have rare species on them, um, and uh, working with the landowners to help them manage their sites for the benefit of these rare dragonflies. Right, okay, and we'll come to sort of rare species in a minute, because we'll, we'll, we'll start off sort of from a, a, a sort of, if you like, a macro perspective. Dragonflies in Scotland, um, how are they doing, you know, what, what overall mm -hmm. what's sort of the status of the dragonfly are they doing okay yeah well they're, they're generally speaking dragonflies in scotland are doing all right and um, we have 23 breeding species of dragonfly in scotland including three that are only found in scotland in the in within the uk so they're quite quite special species but we do have many species that are coming from the south and if you look at it, an atlas, um, like the, B the BDS produced a, a wonderful atlas in 2014. If you look at, <laughs> of course, you'll love that. Yeah. So if you look at the range of lots of species of dragonfly in the 2014 atlas, and then you look at an, an atlas, let's say, from 20 years before that, it's amazing how um, how many species have managed to push their way north with, with climate change. So that obviously we're, we're having warmer winters. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the larvae are managing to survive over over winter, whereas when we had very cold winters, then the, the larvae uh, probably would have been killed off. So so we're, we're getting more dragonflies coming to Scotland. But um, probably the, the biggest risk to our dragonflies at the moment is is climate change. So the other side of the climate change page is um, dragonfly habitats will be getting uh, drier as, as temperatures get hotter. And certainly our, some of our rare species, such as the azure hawker and the, the northern emerald, which are two of the ones that are found in Scotland, and also the northern damselfly, they're found in um, sort of relatively shallow um, habitats, which will probably dry out more and more as, as time goes on. Um, so <clears throat> I think the, the picture for dragonflies in, a more, in more general terms in Scotland is that we're going to be having more species over time, but uh, the more um, specialised species, I think, I suspect that they're not going to be doing so well um, as time goes on. Right, and we'll we'll talk about them three in a second. Um, but because you said, uh, you know, 
dragonflies are spreading north and we're, we're seeing that we're seeing that with birds as well you know it's what a sort of what's the more sort of recent new species recorded in Scotland? Well, we had a record of a broad-bodied chaser in the borders last week. So somebody sent in a, a wonderful picture of the, the broad-bodied chaser, which to you down in Norfolk is probably, I mean, you'll see hundreds of them. But when I was on holiday in Wales a couple of summers ago and I saw my first ever broad-bodied chaser, it was really exciting. So it's quite exciting when we get we get things like that. Um, so, well, there's 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 a, a whole host of species that are here now that never used to be seen. There was another um, broad body chaser that was found in um, Caithness, so right in, on the north coast of Scotland. Uh, uh, one was found in a garden centre, so I suspect that that might have been brought in with some maybe some pond vegetation if it had been um, taken taken to Caithness to be sold there. Since you've mentioned broad-bodied chaser, and clearly, you know, I will see them every season down here, and you have to scrabble around for them up there because they're only just arriving up there. It's only fair to talk about the three species that I won't find here, um, and that you can nip out and see every season. Um, and that's obviously the the two northern, so the northern damselfly, the northern emerald, and the azure hawker. So. You, you mentioned sort of from a conservation point of view that these could be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> from your point of view, which of those three or all of them, you know, which ones, which ones are the most in trouble out of those three? Um, it's quite difficult to say which would be the, the most in trouble. Certainly the Azure Hawker and the Northern Emerald, they, they both use shallow shallow areas on peatlands so um we had an absolutely wonderful survey of uh, uh carrow estate which is on ranich moor it's only accessible by train um it's absolutely wonderful location for the azure hawker and last september in fact the, the previous two septembers Pat, who's the, the Scottish recorder, she covers pretty much the whole of Scotland checking records and 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 recording. She's absolutely amazing. Uh, we went there to do a, a survey at at Carrower and the previous year we'd been there and it had been very cold and wet. Um, it, it, this was at the end of September. And I think in a whole day surveying between the two of us, we found three, three larvae. So it, actually, when it comes to surveying for dragonflies, doing larval surveys easier you get a better idea of the numbers than 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 counting the counting the adults because the adults can be you know away somewhere else feeding whereas the larvae are there in, in the water body so if you want to get an accurate idea of how many you have in breeding then that's a good way to do it yeah. last year we were there on a sunny day well it was a sun we were there for two days Two of us on the first day and we had um, somebody from Crowder Estate on the third day. We did some training for him and, and he took part in the surveys. We found over 200 larvae over the space of the two days. So, and generally speaking, uh, as your hawkers, they're, they're, they're quite rare. They're only, you, you generally only find a few per, per water body. Um, so that is an absolutely wonderful sight. But the ponds, the pools in which we were finding them, they're shallow they will be subjected in a dry summer or dry spring like we've had today, this year. Um, I would imagine a lot of those uh, water bodies will have dried up. Um, hopefully the larvae will be able to get down into where it's still wet at, at the bottom of the pools, but I suspect some of them will die. It's very similar with the, the Northern Emeralds because that, that uses, again, shallow sphagnum filled bog pools or little runnels. Um, so it will be subject to the same sort of um, same sort of drying out conditions. Um, the northern damselfly, which has it has a different habitat, so it has it uses sort of sedge fringed pools. Um, we have an excellent site not far from me, just south of Pitlochry um, at Logie Rate Curling Pond. And, um, and you'll know this yourself, but unless a water body is managed, then over time vegetation will fill in. Um, eventually, it may take decades or it may just take a few years, then um, it, the vegetation fills in and quite often there's no open water left. So 
that's probably what's affecting um, northern damselflies here in Scotland. Um, so one of the things we're wanting to do is uh, this year try and get um, details of as many of their breeding sites as possible, what sort of condition they're in, and then we're going to have a, a, a good sort of springboard from which to work with these northern damselfly site owners if we can do some management work to improve those sites for, for the northern damselfly. So climate change, warming temperatures, that's going to make things even worse as the, the, the water evaporates more quickly. So all three of them, I'd say, um, yeah, we, we, we need to keep an eye on what's going on. Yeah, so the thing is, something like the northern damselfly that is using these these pools and you need to keep mm -hmm. the pools open. Um, that sounds like, not easy, but an easier management uh, project that needs putting in place than shallow pools that are drying yeah. up. How would you, and you might not know the answer to this because I'm trying desperately to think an answer, but how do you sort of mitigate for that? You know, how, how do you say, right, okay, well, you know, the, the, these pools and these pools are shallow and these pools are going to dry up. How do you, you can't counter that. How, any well, ideas? Yeah, well, one of the things that they're doing on Carrower Estate is uh, they're doing, and this is happening on quite a few of our hotspots as well, actually, is the Scottish government's invested millions in peatland restoration. So that's part of mitigating the effects of climate change because peatlands work really well as, um, as sponges. They hold on to water in times of, in times of um, it, when we've got lots of rain. They also hold on to water in times of drought. Um, and it's a great carbon uh, carbon sink as well. So, exactly. um, so at Carrower, there's been lots of peatland restoration going on. So that involves blocking blocking ditches, which would have been put in maybe 50 years ago or after the Second World War, when there was this big push on on putting in uh, forestry on Highland estates, um, and quite quite often they were planted on peat, so they had to drain the peat. So they put in all di lots of ditches. So having peatland restoration going on at a lot of different places here in Scotland is is great for dragonflies. Um, <clears throat> another thing we can do is uh, actually dig ponds um, close to ponds that are probably going to be drying up so we can get in there with a mini digger or uh, on our hot spots we do this with volunteers. Um, <laughs> yeah. The dog's always going to be saying something about that. Um, uh, He's yes, volunteering. <laughs> Um, so yes, so you, you can you can do something, but again, it's quite a lot of work, and you need to work quite closely with the with the land manager. So certainly, at our hotspot in uh, Flanders Moss, which is on a peatland, they've been doing lots of peatland restoration. A fantastic spot for dragonflies, obviously, it being a hotspot. And um, but one of the things we've been doing is uh, we've been uh, digging out a few new pools for dragonflies every few years so that as succession takes place, so as the vegetation starts to fill in different ponds, um, if the the conditions aren't so good for uh, certain species of dragonflies, then they can then use the, the new ponds which have possibly better, better conditions. So there's always those ponds in place that the dragonflies can use. So it is possible, but um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of work. Sure. Sure. Uh, I think most things in conservation are nowadays. You, we're up against so much, you know. It's, I know. Um, so you mentioned the hotspots and, it, it, you know, that, that's what we're going to talk about. Hotspots is, I mean, you know, the hotspots started in Scotland and was that mm -hmm. was in 2014. So yeah. it was in around about the time, just after the time you started. So first of all, just for those that might not have seen the other interviews, um, just give us a quick overview of what a hotspot is, what constitutes a dragonfly hotspot. Okay, well a dragonfly hotspot um, has to have three things really. So the first one obviously is it's got to be a great a great place to see dragonflies. Secondly, it has to have fairly easy access around the site so that people can get to these locations to see the dragonflies. And thirdly, it has to have um, sort of the potential for involving people in dragonfly conservation or um, they're, they're fantastic hubs for, for engaging, engaging with people and helping them learn about dragonflies. So we've done all sorts of things at our dragonfly hotspots here in Scotland from um, 
teacher training courses for teachers at Crombie Country Park, which was our first our first dragonfly hotspot. Um, I worked there as a seasonal ranger many years ago, and that's when I first fell in love with dragonflies because they were just so so easy to see. And um, we do lots of guided walks, ID training, recorded recording training during the summer. And in the autumn, we sort of switch over to doing volunteer tasks at our at the pond. So we help to manage the ponds so that they're in good condition for, for the dragonflies. And again, it's a great pond management days are great fun. They're always very, very muddy, but but really good. You can see, you know, the before and afters. You can see how much work you can achieve in a fairly short length of time. And it helps to keep on top of these ponds for 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 the benefit of the dragonflies. So yeah, all sure. sorts of different things for at the hotspots. Excellent. So I'm I'm going to because I'll be talking about um, the Ponds for People project with Andrea. Uh, mm. So that'll go up at some stage. Um, but just sort of stepping back, which was the first hotspot, and where did the idea come from? Who, who came up with the idea of yeah, let's let's start up a network of of hotspots. Yeah, well, the first the first hotspot was at Crombie Country Park in Angus, so that's quite close to Carnoustie. Um, and the idea, I think, it, I think the trustees of the BDS came up with the idea for for hotspots, and it is an absolutely fantastic idea. It is, yeah. I mean, you know, certainly a lot of what you mentioned there, because it, it's. To me, it's ticking quite a few boxes. It's ticking an ob the obvious one, which is the conservation of sort of dragonflies. Yeah, obviously. Um, but it's also sort of ticking the sort of not just the community engagement element, but also the education element, uh, which is quite key because you know we need people to be educated about these things if they're going to care about them. Um, so from that point of view, you know, it, it's it's really good. So successful How, how's it how's it gone today they have been yeah they've been brilliant um some hotspots are better than others of course as that's always going to be the case but we've got 10 hotspots from scotston moor in the north um at aberdeen and that's run by the aberdeen city ranger service down to um carlaverock wetland center in dumfries and galloway so sort of other ends the opposite end of the country um, and the, 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 depending on the staff, depending on the resources, how many people there are and so on, their, their, their knowledge levels and so on. Um, <clears throat> sometimes the BDS will go out and do, do the events. Uh, sometimes the staff will, will, run the, will run the events and do the volunteer tasks. So um, let's see, uh, the, the rangers at Scottsdale Moor, they do dragonfly walks, they have dragonfly engagement events, they do dragonfly volunteer tasks. So that's fantastic. That that runs by itself, and they and they have lots of volunteers that that can come along and take part. And there'll be other people that don't really know much about dragonflies that will come along and take part. Yeah. Um. So yeah, they've worked really, really well, and it's good that we've got quite a good geographical coverage as well. It sounds like a really sort of lucrative project, or a, a really good idea from the point of view as I mentioned the boxes that have been ticked. Is it just yourselves, or are you working in partnership with others on this? Well, we we work in partnership with the the site managers of the of the hotspots, and um, but also we receive funding from SNH. So when I first started, Scottish Natural Heritage helped to fund my post, and um, they they said they said they wanted to see hotspots in this area, in this area, in this area, which helped us to focus on where we would work with those land those work with those landowners to to get the the hotspots implemented so yeah. scottish natural heritage has has been quite a, a steer on the project as well right and and i've looked through the sort of 10 or certainly the overview that's on the website um and i, I think it's fair to say you know that there's, there's some sort of special i mean things like again another one that you wouldn't see very commonly in norfolk there are places where you can, um, but the black data, you've got black data to some of your hotspots, golden ringed, which again, you know, is not enough, especially you've got some of them up there. Yeah. Um, but what, I've, what I noticed was that it doesn't mention the three specialties um, that people would come to Scotland for. 
And that, you know, it didn't surprise me. You know, at the end of the day, these are very specialist habitats. Um, but are there, you know, is there a hotspot that may hold one of these species that you could point people at? Or are they just outside of the hotspots? Well, most of the rare species are found outside hotspots, but Flanders moss, which is a peatland, and that's that's near Stirling, so it's it's um, it's it's quite a special place because it is one of the most southerly known sites of the northern emerald dragonfly, and it's quite exciting because. Um, a sighting came in from the site manager just it was either last week or the week before and he'd seen two adults flying around close to the boardwalk and up until last year we just had sightings of the northern emerald from the west side of the reserve which isn't really accessible to the public so now they might be they might be breeding on on this side of the reserve as well so we're hoping to go out in the autumn and do some more larval surveys to see if we can find them closer close to the east side here because if we can if people can see the northern emeralds at Flanders, that's fantastic. Especially if they're on their dragonfly holidays, as lots of people are, and yeah. they're they're heading north, um, and they can stop off near Stirling to 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 see Flanders moths. Which, as you were saying, um, there's lots of species there that you don't see coming from the south. So we've got um, lots of black darters there. Nice and easy to see black darters. You'll see common you'll see common darters. But um, yeah, if they could see a northern emerald at Flanders, that would be quite a coup. That would be, yeah, exceptional, exceptional. Um, mental note to self. <laughs> um, so there's 10 at the moment. And I know that, um, you know, in England, they're starting to pick them up and in Wales, they're starting to pick them up. What's the future looking like for Scotland? Are, are you looking at sort of continuing with the project and adding more projects or just concentrating on the 10 that you've got? We're going to concentrate on the the ten that we've got, um, basically because both of the Scottish officers we are both two days a week, so there's only um, it's quite a limited staff time that we can um, that we can spend on visiting our, our hotspots. So yeah, we're we're keeping to the ten and working well with the ten and making sure that they're really successful, rather than maybe making ourselves a bit more thin on the ground if we take on more more hotspots. But um, and the 10 works quite well for us just now. They're, they're, it's quite well distributed across the country. And uh, as a result of training courses, as a result of having these hotspots as, as you know, sinks of getting people in to do the, the training courses and so on, we get quite a lot of records back as, as a result, um, which, is the, which is the aim really, because we need to know where dragonflies are to conserve them. So it's all about getting those records in. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's it's a great project, as I've said to your colleagues when I've interviewed them in the past. Um, it's great that it started in Scotland, and you know it's great that you've got ten sites there that you know will continue to do that education and engagement piece, uh, which says it's just so crucial, um, as crucial probably as any conservation methods that you put in place because yeah. you, you need to engage people for not just to gain members and to gain um, funds, but, you know, so that you can gain recorders so that you can understand where these things are and what their movements are. Um, so in the meantime, thank you very much. I uh, sort of look forward to getting up there one day and, and sort of seeing some of these specialists. I haven't seen any of them. I'm also in Scotland at the wrong time of the year. Uh, so one day, who knows, I might be somebody that's going on a dragonfly holiday. <laughs> so. But in the meantime, thank you ever so much and good luck with the sort of project and hopefully you'll be able to get out there and engage with them at some stage in the not too distant future. I hope so. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, yeah, drop me a line if you're if you're heading over the border and we can we can help you out with some good places to, to see those rare species. Brilliant. Thank you and thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.